Have you been reminded yet just how powerful, first of all, the Word of God is? Secondly, even more importantly, how powerful His name is. His name is so powerful. Demons bow at that name of Jesus. They don't bow at religion. They don't run from religion. They run from Him. As you're turning to Acts chapter 8, verse 35, <clears throat> let me just say what a masterful job Sister Goff did at the funeral yesterday. Just, I was just sitting in the congregation listening to how she ministered, not just to the family, but ministered to many of Tony's friends and just moved in the Holy Ghost. And I'm just so proud of what's happening the ministry that this church has and how they minister to those that are hurting. Paul, it's great to see you today. So glad you're here. So good to see you again. Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto Jesus. First of all, what he was preaching is Isaiah 53, 7. This is what he was reading. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading the word of God. And God spoke to Philip, and he said, I want you to go get close to him, and there's something I have for you to do. It says this, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. Now notice, backing up, I'm giving some hopefully some understanding, maybe some remembrance. It says he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now just time out for just a moment. The world, I believe in Jesus. It says he preached unto him Jesus. And there are many that feel if you just say, I believe in Jesus or I heard preaching on Jesus or I believe Jesus died for my sins or I believe... That's wonderful. That's a great step. But here it says he preached unto him Jesus, and people like to put a period there and say story over. It's not over. It says they went on their way, and they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, not Philip. The man that was standing in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah got preached Jesus to he said, let me tell you about Jesus. And next thing you know, the eunuch said, here's water, not Philip. Many times we like to say, you need to be. And he was telling them about Isaiah and how Jesus matches up with the prophecies in Isaiah. And the eunuch said, here's water. Watch this. What doth hinder me? He didn't say, how come you're not baptized yet? And you need to, and what, what, the guy himself, hey, here's water. What's stopping me? What's stopping me? Yeah. What's hindering me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart. He said, not just everybody should be baptized, but if you're really ready to commit to him, all of your heart, not just here. He didn't say, if you're ready to believe with all your mind. Well, I understand the scriptures and Jesus died for my sins. Oh, come on. He said, believe with all your heart. If you're ready to believe with all of your heart, now I'm ready to baptize you. But watch. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So what happened so far? He preached unto him, Jesus. He believed with all his heart. And next thing you know, what did Philip tell him? Just believe on Jesus. That's not, that's not what he said. If Philip got into the chariot with this man and expounded unto him prophecy of the Messiah. The next thing you know, the man says, there's water. 
What's stopping me from getting in? What's stopping me from being baptized? Well, it must have come from Philip saying, well, all I have to do is believe. Must have. What did Philip tell him? The ERV, based on what the eunuch said, he said, what is stopping me? What doth hinder me? What is stopping me? The BBE, the Bible in basic English says, why may I not have baptism? Why may I not have it? He didn't say, well, that's not the way I see it. He didn't say, well, I've already been saved. He didn't say, but I've had experiences in the past. The man said, why may I not have it? Well, how did he know about it? Because that's what Philip taught him. The CEV says, why can't I be baptized? The message says, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? Why can't I? <laughs> I'm trying to give us a mind shift today. Instead of reading the Word of God and coming up with reasons why we can't, it's about time somebody asked the Lord, why can't I? Somebody tell me why not. The word in the Greek is kuloo, which means to a stop, that is prevent. What's preventing me? What's forbidding me? What's hindering me? What's keeping me from? What's withstanding me? That's what that word means. When he said, when he said, what doth hinder me? That's what all that means. He said, there's something in my way, but I'm getting it out of my way because there's water there. You told me about Jesus and I'm getting in. What's stopping? So I want to preach on the question. Why not? Why not? Would you pray with me for a moment? Jesus, we know lots of stuff about the word there are Bible studies. There is new converts. There is discipleship training. There is ministry and training. There is leadership training. There is pastoral training. It all happens right here, Jesus. And the question has got to stop being why, and it needs to be why not. God, we're asking you today to help us to begin thinking. Lord, whatever you want me to do, why not? God, whatever it is I need, why not? Whatever you want me to obey, why not? Help me, Jesus, to, to leave this world behind and say, why not? If you want me to live for you, why not? Help us to get the hindering things out of our way. And I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said in Jesus' name. Look at your neighbor, shake their hand and say, why not? You've already started. You know why I'm here. You know what I'm after. You know what God's after. You've already started to formulate reasons why not. Why well, better get out of here quick when he gets done preaching. Otherwise, I'm going to have to come up with some ideas on why I didn't. Hey, honey, is there any way I can make my phone ring so it looks like I got a business call? An emergency me Hello, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, earthquake? Yeah, I'll be right there. Sorry, I'd, I'd come up. We're already formulating things. In our, your, it's your flesh. What doth hinder me? I'll tell you what it does. Your flesh. Your flesh is saying, no, I don't want to submit to the Word of God. I don't want to submit to the Spirit of God. I don't. I don't want to. Guess what? You're not alone. You're just like every other person in this building and every other person that drives by this, this church and every other person that is breathing today in this world, you are the same flesh as they are. Their flesh does not want to serve God. <clears throat> it does not want to submit. It does not want to obey the word of God. It doesn't want to. Acts 8, 5. Now, this is the same Philip. 
My question was, it says he baptized him. The question was, how? How did Philip, there are people that will stop right there and say, oh, oh. It just says he baptized him. It doesn't say how. It doesn't say if he sprinkled. It doesn't say if it was in the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or in Jesus' name. It doesn't say. I do know this. The Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. If you want to know the truth, you're going to have to find it. You're going to have to go look for it. There's not one scripture that says here it is. If you want to be saved, it's right there. There's just one scripture. That's not even scriptural. But he baptized him. How? First of all, who was doing the baptizing? Philip. Okay, we know who baptized. In Acts chapter 8, verse 5, the Bible says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ. It sounds like he just ran around the city going, Christ! 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 The Bible does say by the foolishness of preaching, we're going to be saved. So, Christ! There are people that just say, that's all it is. He just said, believe on Jesus. Believe on Jesus. Believe on Jesus. And the people with one accord gave heed. They paid attention. Unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So when Philip preached Christ, there were miracles which people heard and saw. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed. Now, this was just because he preached Jesus. If people just preach Jesus, these things are supposed to happen. That's what, so whatever preaching Jesus is needs to include that. Many were possessed and many taken with palsies and that were lame, they were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Why? Because Philip preached Jesus. When he preached Jesus, miracle signs and wonders came with it. And because of that, people were delivered from spirits. They were delivered from sickness. They were delivered from diseases. And the Bible says in Samaria that there was great joy in the city. Great joy, according to Acts chapter 8, does not mean you're saved. Well, when I, when I accepted Jesus, I had great joy. Don't tell me I'm not saved. I don't need to. Philip does. He already said it. Watch, in verse 12, same chapter. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. Wait a minute. He was preaching Christ. It's just another way to say it. Here it says he was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. So you can call it preaching Christ. You can call it preaching concerning the kingdom of God, comma. Philip was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, comma, and the name of Jesus. So he was preaching Christ, preaching the kingdom, the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ. When he preached those things, I know I'm being redundant, and I'm sorry I'm being redundant. Preached Christ. Preach things concerning the kingdom of God, and he preached the name of Jesus. When all that happened, it says they were baptized, both men and women. How do you think Philip baptized? We'll get to that in a minute. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, now Simon believed, but when he believed, he also was baptized. By whom? Philip just got done preaching baptism. It was Philip who was there. It was Philip who was doing the leading. It was Philip who was doing the preaching. And when Philip preached about the name of Jesus, people were baptized. And then Simon said, you know what? I think I'm going to be baptized too. So it was all in the same context. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them. I'm sorry, back up. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, 
heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Now they called it receiving the word of God. We've preached Jesus Christ. We've preached the, the things concerning the kingdom. We preached the name of Jesus. And now it says they received the word of God. They sent unto them Peter and John. Peter and John went to Samaria. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized. Here it is. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ding, 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 ding. You win. Did you see how all of that, well, you guys, you, you guys are so hooked on one scripture. I just read almost the whole chapter to you. And the whole thing leads, it, it alludes all the way down the way until it finally says, by the way, just in case you were a little misunderstood, in case you tried to weasel out, in case you try to ask the question why, I'm asking you why not. It just says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my question is, why not? Why not? Then laid they their hands upon them. Wait a minute. They already believed. They already heard the things concerning the kingdom. And they already were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people, Peter and John, came down and laid hands upon them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Why didn't Peter and John just say, oh, it doesn't matter? If it wasn't important, Peter and John would have just sent them a text. They're already set. They're already saved. Leave them alone. Don't confuse them. They said, hey, we're coming. We're willing to pack up our stuff and travel all the way to Samaria because these people are having trouble getting the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, we'll travel all the way to get to you. I'll lay hands on you. Someone will lay hands on you because it's important that we have the Holy Ghost. Again, Acts 10, 44 while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did he know? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. This is a man who was committed to God and he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and then God appeared to him, an angelic being in vision. And God said, you need to go send for a man by the name of Peter. Notice it says, can any man forbid water? They received the Holy Ghost and Peter said, can any man forbid water? Kaluo, same word. As the Ethiopian eunuch spoke when he said, what doth hinder me? What prevents me? What stands in my way? What's stopping me from obeying the word of God? Peter said the same thing. What is preventing these people that they should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Peter said they got the Holy Ghost the same way we did on the day of Pentecost. Now, what's stopping them? What's the, when he was saying, why not? Why not? They got the Holy Ghost. Someone said, well, they already got the Holy Ghost. They don't need to be baptized. That's not what Peter said. Peter said, since God gave them the Holy Ghost, why not get baptized in the name of Jesus and fulfill the tabernacle type and foreshadow? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Why not? Why not? Why do we always look for an opportunity to avoid obeying the word of God? Instead, instead we should be looking for ways to obey it. Oh, but what if I do too much? So what? Can you possibly do too much to get to heaven? Can we possibly pray too much? Can we possibly fast? Can we... Can we do too much to attain heaven? Peter went before the council in Acts chapter 11. And he said, he was giving Cornelius 
testimony. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house. That'd be nice. Which stood and said unto him, angel speaking, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. So the angel told Cornelius to send men to get me. That's what Peter said. Cornelius, the, the Greek, the Gentile, he said he had a vision. That angel told him to send men to get me by name. You go get Peter, and here's what he said. Who shall tell thee words, whereby thou in all thy house shall be saved? Still Peter, reiterating the, reiterating the words of the angel. That's what Peter, Peter said. The angel told Cornelius to come and get me to tell Cornelius words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Is God interested in helping us or what? He sends an angel to go get a man to tell them to travel across the desert to get to Cornelius' house to tell him how to be saved. Awesome. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much, Peter summarizes, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord. It's just another way to phrase it. He said, they believed on the Lord. Well, I, how do you know that? Because they got the Holy Ghost. I know they did. He said, what was I that I could withstand? Kaluo. Same word. Peter said, I wasn't about to stand in anybody's way. When I saw him get the Holy Ghost, the people that believed on the Lord, when they did, they received the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. He said, I wasn't going to Kaluo. I wasn't going to stop him. I wasn't going to stand in his way. I wasn't going to be an obstacle in the way of salvation. I got out of the way. When they heard, when the council heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles, notice how he says it, granted repentance unto life. Well, did it change? No. It's just another, he's like, praise, if, if you and I talk, and we say, well, the guy got saved. What does that mean? It means there was preaching on, uh, on Christ. There were things taught concerning the kingdom of God. There was Jesus' name was involved. People got the Holy Ghost. They spoke with tongues, and they repented. That's what this means. Cornelius gladly received Peter's words. Now, what did Peter tell them? What did Peter say when he got to Cornelius' house? Just believe on Jesus. He didn't tell them to be godly. He didn't tell them to pray every day. He didn't tell them to greatly respect God with everybody that's in your house. He did not tell Cornelius to be a generous giver. Why? Because they already were. These are things that Cornelius and his family were already doing. They were praying. They were giving. They were respecting God. They were already righteous. So what did Peter tell him? He didn't tell him to pray. If we consolidate Acts 10 and 11, we find believing on the Lord, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, receiving the Holy Ghost the same way Peter did on the day of Pentecost, and making sure that we don't prevent God from doing what he wants to do. The question is not why. 
The question is why not? What is hindering us? What is hindering you? What is hindering me today from taking the next step? What is God asking us to do? He has prophesied to us. He has displayed his glory. He has manifested his power in this building. And we still sit and ask the question, why? God is saying, why not? Why not now? Why not you? Why not me? That same Peter said unto them in Acts chapter 2, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself. That goes a little bit against a lot of the religious religious rhetoric that's out there. The Bible says, Save yourselves from this untoward or perverse generation. Save yourself. What what? possibly could that mean when we know there is no way that we could save ourselves that would that would be humanism that would be atheism but the truth is is we can save ourselves how do we do that when jesus christ robed himself in flesh and came amongst us and let the blood spill out of his veins to pay for our sins it provided the antidote that we can take care of the poison that has entered our body called sin and he puts that little that little hypodermic needle at the altar and he says i brought the antidote save yourself you can say I'm not going to give you the needle you got to put it in yourself why not why not why not the needle is here the antidote is present his power is here why not Hallelujah. Oh, let's let's continue that for a moment. Lord, I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to get things out of the way. Why not? Why not? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 9, Saul, who became Paul, His concept of God changed. That's a little unnerving when a person is so dedicated to God that they're willing to stand by and watch somebody be murdered because of what they themselves believe. I'm willing to throw people in jail, I'm willing to give them to the gladiators. Watch them be torn apart by lions. I'm willing to to confiscate these people's lives, steal their lives, and give them for the sake of what I believe. Yet this very man changed his concept of God. Behoove it to us to do the same. Do we have a concept of God that begins to speak out and say, why not? Or does our concept of God, is it so little that, our, that his majesty and his omnipotence doesn't cause us to be righteous and evangelize this world? Is that really the truth? Do we have such a low, a low perception of God? Or is our, is our consecration to God so incredible that we say, if you'll speak to me, if you'll help me understand the scriptures, I will change my concept of you. Because of what happened to Saul, falling on his face, the Bible says in verse 5, he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? 
I've had similar responses from people who have committed themselves to Jesus all of their life. And the next thing you know, something is preached, something is taught. And they look with consternation. Are you saying that what I've believed all my life? I'm a little uncomfortable with that. That what I've believed all my life, you're, you're asking me to change my concept of God? Well, I like to get back to the Word of God where it says, Saul heard the Lord, the one whom he's committed his life. Why are you persecuting me, Saul? Must be the devil. Must be deceiving me. Saul just got real smart, real logical. I think I'll go ask Granny what she thinks. He didn't. He didn't go ask his former pastor either. <laughs> he just said, well, since you're already talking to me, God was speaking to him. Saul, you're persecuting me. First thing I'm going to do is check and see if there's another Saul standing in the vicinity. <laughs> nope, I'm the only one. Thought so. So you're talking to me. Yep. You're perse persecuting me. Well, I guess my next question is, who are you? My concept is that you're Jehovah and you say that I'm persecuting you, but I'm really not because what I'm really doing is persecuting these Jesus people. I'm persecuting these people that believe in Jesus and you say I'm persecuting, uh-oh, did you catch that? I'm persecuting Jesus believers and you say I'm persecuting, talk about a oneness. <laughs> Jesus was saying, God, Jehovah of the Old Testament was saying, yeah, that's me. You missed it. It's me. If you read the scripture, you'll find out hundreds of scriptures that support that. But he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And then in verse 6, he trembling, astonished, said, Lord, why not? That's really what he said. He had an encounter with God. <clears throat> God said, my name is Jesus. Okay, why not? Let's move forward. He said, what wilt thou have me to do? He didn't say I need to pray about it. He didn't say I need to consult with. He said, why not? Instead of me asking the question, why, Paul Saul asked, why not? I've just had an encounter with you. I'm not going to fight the word of God any longer. I'm not going to fight your spirit. I'm just going to say, why not? Oh, that we would get that feeling inside of us that would stop resisting all parts. The Bible says that if we offend the word of God in any part, we've offended the whole word. It's time to stop piecemealing the word of God and just say, I want it all. Why not? I want it all. I want it all. Why not? Notice this in verse 10. There was a certain disciple at the Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord. Ananias was in Damascus. God spoke to him in a vision. And he said, what do you need, Lord? But in verse 6, backing up, the Lord said, get up. After Saul, Paul said, what do you want me to do? Please, please look at this. The Lord said unto him, I am your shepherd. I will always direct you. I will. He didn't say that. It said, it shall, he said, you go into Damascus, into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I'm not going to tell you. I've already spoken to a man by the name of Ananias about you. 
and you need to go to him and get direction from him. It's not wrong. It's not wrong to have spiritual leadership, people that we look up to. It's not wrong to say, oh, I had an encounter with God. Would you please give me some understanding? God did not tell him other than revealing because the Bible says flesh and bone hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven, he's going to reveal who I am. That's what he said. The revelation does not come from mankind. The revelation comes from from God, but the discipleship doesn't come from God, it comes from man. A man will disciple you, and you must disciple. Do you hear me? That's what we've got to do. God is speaking to some people here today, and He's saying, There's a man on his way in. Oh, God. There's a woman on her way into the church and she had a vision and I spoke to her and when she gets here, I've already talked to you and when she gets here, this is what I want you to do. I'm not going to tell her what to do. I'm going to tell you what to tell her. If that is not a scriptural mandate on sacrifices and giving ourselves for the sake of some, you know what Ananias said? Okay, yes, God, I'm hearing from you, and you're speaking to me right now, but isn't that the guy that's killing people like me? What is he saying? To disciple will cause you risk. And that's why many risk to what? My finances? Risk to my schedule? Risk to my priorities? That's what this is all about. Ananias is like, wait a minute, I, you know, I, I kind of like breathing, and this guy makes sure that Christians don't. God said, I got it. I wish we would look at every scripture in the word of God and say, why not? Why not? God, this is you, and I trust you. It will be told thee what to do. They went to Damascus. God showed Ananias in a vision. He said, I'm here, Lord. The Lord said, get up and go into the street called Straight and ask about in the house of Judas. There's one by the name of Saul of Tarsus. He's praying. You tell me God doesn't know your situation. He knows the city. I love this. I love this. I love this. He knows the city. He knows the street. In case you get a little confused, it's on the city called Straight. By the way, there's a man that lives on the city by the name of Straight. His name is Judas. Do you get it? God is specific, and he's saying, I have direction for you, and here is where it is. It's here, here, here. Let's whittle it down. Do you want me to give you his phone number? Watch this. Saul is praying, and Saul saw in a vision a man named Ananias. Oh, wait, that's my name. He's talking to Ananias. Saul had a vision. In that vision, a man by the name of Ananias. Well, I can't get Pastor Smet to go. It would ruin God's vision. He, Saul, saw in a vision a man by the name of Ananias. So either you change your name or I'm going. You know what I'm saying? This is so, God will give you. God does not want to get somebody else to do your job my job. God is saying, I'm giving somebody a vision and they're having a vision of the name of Robert Betcher and you need to go. You need to involve. You need to invest. God doesn't want to use somebody else. He wants to use us. Oh, I got to quit. I'm having too much fun. Oh. He saw in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him. Imagine getting a vision. I have a vision of a person named such and such. And I saw them coming to me and laying their hand on me. And when they prayed, my sight, I was blinded and I was able to see. Well, God, it's been four years. Where is Ananias? Where is he? Because I saw him in a vision come to me and I still can't see. I'm still waiting, Jesus. Please tell, tell, 
preach. Somebody preached to Ananias and tell him that it's okay. I won't hurt him. I'm just waiting for a healing. <sighs> Jesus. Can you feel that? I want you to ask yourself a question. Why not? Why not? Lord, I have heard by many how much evil this person has done. He's got authority. But the Lord said, he's a chosen vessel. What Saul is waiting for me? Paul wrote over half the New Testament, all based on Ananias. What person is God waiting for? You've been prophesied to. You've had people lay hands upon you. You've had incredible experiences with God, and yet we still sit and answer the question or ask the question, why? Ananias went his way, went into the house, put his hands on him, and said, either out of obedience or out of fear, maybe out of pure hope, brother, Brother Saul, oh, Brother Saul, I hope this works. I hope I really heard from God. You know, that's, that's the time when you know you heard from God. <laughs> well, I, God spoke to me, and I, okay, really? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and pray for a murderer. Well, let me pray about that. Maybe, I, maybe it was God told me you should go. Maybe I was, I don't really know if that's God. If God speaks to you, you just go and do it. You put your life at risk and go pray for a murderer. <sighs> Please stand with me as I try to close this up. <sighs> Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus, just in case you don't know who the Lord is. The Lord, he told me what his name was. That's why I know. He told me firsthand. I wasn't taught this. God said, my name is Jesus. So the Lord, Jesus, it's Jesus. He appeared unto you. And now God showed Ananias. He told him about Saul's vision. And now Ananias is confirming that what Saul actually had in the vision really happened. Here, let me tell you, God told me what you saw. I'm telling you, that gets people's attention. And it said, he appeared to thee in the way that you came, and he sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute, I don't want, I, I didn't want the Holy Ghost. I just want, I just want to see. And Ananias said, no, God get, told me to come and pray for you that you would receive your sight and that you would be filled with the Holy Ghost. Good. Immediately there fell from his eyes as, as it had been scales and received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Wait a minute. It doesn't say in Jesus' name. Who did the baptizing? Ananias. Who did he baptize? Paul. How did Paul baptize in Acts chapter 19? In Jesus' name. Connect the dots. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. What would you have me to do? What really hinders us? We need to ask that question. There are things that you and I know to do today, right now. You've heard a lot of this preached and taught before, probably five times, exploring God's word, ALC, discipleship, seven steps, and me preaching 14 times. You've heard, you've heard this preached, but not from this context. What doth hinder me? That didn't come from the preacher. It came from the person that was being preached to. He asked the question. Here is an opportunity for me to step forward in God. What's stopping me? Is it sin? Well, you know, I, 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 I feel commitment. I don't want to stop living the way that I'm living. That will answer your question. That will hinder you. It will stop you from saying, all right, uncle, I give in. Flesh, your flesh doesn't want it. Doubt. Well, I saw people receive the Holy Ghost one time, and it scared 
me. And I don't, I, 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 that's doubt. Forget about that. Why don't you just say instead of why? Well, well, I, I, I'll, I, I'll go ahead and receive the Holy Ghost as long as, as long as, as God doesn't do any of that funny stuff. Where'd that come from? What about ignorance? Change brings fear. Fear of the unknown. Peer pressure. If I do this, then I'm denouncing every generation before me that had a different concept of God. You're answering your own question, why? My question is, why not? Why would you not grab for more of God? When we read the scriptures, our question shouldn't be, why should I? But it should be, what's stopping me? The Bible teaches us to pray. Why not? What's stopping us from praying? I don't see anybody holding a gun to our head every morning. If you pray, I'm going to pull the trigger. The only thing that's stopping you from prayer is you asking yourself the question, why not? The Bible says to study, study the word to show thyself approved unto God. What's stopping you? What's stopping me? Repent and turn away from sin. What's stopping me? What's stopping you? We have to be born again of water and spirit. I'd be glad to teach you a Bible study on how the scriptures teach that that's water baptism in Jesus' name and receiving the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues like the apostles did. What's stopping me? What's stopping you? Ask yourself, I know I'm driving there. Ask yourself, what is stopping me from praying an hour a day? What's stopping me from opening up my Bible instead of turning on the TV or throwing in another video or playing video games in Xbox or running and playing another game of golf? What's stopping you? Playing golf is not a sin, but if you haven't read your Bible for a week, it is because it has taken a precedent over the Word. What's stopping us? Well, my kids, they're in this and that and this and that and my schedule and, I, and finances in my house. And I mean, what's stopping us? You and I need to ask ourselves that question. The revival that God wants to bring to Chicago Metro is greater than anyone can ever even imagine. And yet God is saying, why not? And we sit there and say, why? Why do I have to do this and why do I have to do that? And God is saying, why not? Would you bow your heads with me today? Jesus. So many excuses. I couldn't come to church Sunday morning because my favorite team was playing. Couldn't come to church. Oh, God. I couldn't pray because I was tired because the soccer game went late last night. I had to go to a party, a PTA meeting. And they were up till 11, and so I just couldn't make it. God, what excuses? What's stopping us? What is stopping us from doing what we already know to do? God, the Ethiopian simply said, I get it. This is an opportunity for me to take a step forward. And there's nothing going to stop me from doing it. What doth hinder me from being baptized? We're already going to have one baptism today. We're going to take the cover off. So there's nothing hindering you. The only question is, do you believe in Jesus with all of your heart? With all of your heart. Are you willing to give him all of your heart? If so, the water's hot, it's filtered, and it's ready. What doth hinder you? If you have a disease in your body, ask yourself the question, why not? Why would you go another day 
without getting prayed for. Well, I don't like them touching my fort. Do you want to limp through the rest of your life or do you want to put someone with a little oil on your forehead and pray the prayer of faith that it might save them that are sick? Why not? If you're a long ways from God, my question to you today is, why not? Why wouldn't you take this opportunity? The presence of God, it's moving. It's not like a tidal wave today. It's like a gradual pressure. Can you feel it? It's, it's squeezing. It's wooing and it's calling. That's because God's not going to get behind you and kick you all the way to the altar. That's like a goat. And God doesn't call you a goat. He calls you a sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. I don't kick them. He says, come. Jesus is saying to you this morning, come unto me, all ye that are weary, all ye that are heavy laden. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Do you need him this morning? He's here, and he's reaching for you. I invite you. Grab your neighbor by the hand and tell him, let's go. Let's go. He, he wants to do something for you. I may not know what it is, but I know he's got something special for you. And I want you to receive it. I want, I'm not condemning you. I'm not minimizing your experience with God. I'm just saying God has talked to you today and I'm inviting you to come. Let's come. And we should ask God our question. Why not? Today, Lord, I'm going to start praying. I'm going to start reaching for the lost. I'm going to start discipling, making disciples. I'm going to start today. I'm going to take someone out to lunch and start reaching into their lives to disciple them today. Why not? Come on, ask yourself the question, why not? There's miracles that are here right now that God wants to do. Ask him, why not? Why not me? And why not now? Come on, let's reach.